Summary Psycho-Cybernetics, Updated and Expanded, Maxwell Maltz. Book link click here, Psycho-Cybernetics by Maxwell Maltz, MD has sold over 35 million copies worldwide since it was first published in 1960. The book teaches visualization, mental imagery, and shaping one's self-image to achieve more success and happiness. Matt Fury, the author of the foreword, was introduced to Psycho-Cybernetics in 1987 by his client Jack. At the time, Fury was struggling as a personal trainer and felt like a failure due to memories of falling short in his wrestling career. Jack told Fury that a person couldn't rise above how they see themselves, and one's self-image dictates what they believe they can achieve. Fury read Psycho-Cybernetics and applied its teachings. Fury realized he felt like a failure because he focused on his past disappointments, losses, and failures rather than successes and accomplishments. Though he achieved a lot as a wrestler, he viewed himself as a failure for not winning every match and title. Psycho-Cybernetics taught Fury how to improve his self-image by reliving his best memories and picturing what he wanted to achieve. This allowed him to overcome his feelings of failure and achieve tremendous success. The key message is that one's self-image powerfully shapes what one believes is possible, and it's possible to improve one's self-image by focusing on positives rather than negatives. Visualization and mental techniques can be used to overcome self-doubt and achieve more. The author, a plastic surgeon, discovered the power of the self-image through his work changing people's physical appearances. He found that changing a person's face often led to changes in personality, behavior, and ability. However, in some cases, patients showed no difference in character after surgery. The author realized that changing a person's physical appearance wasn't enough. Something else, a person's self-image or mental concept of themselves, also needed to change for their personality and behavior to change. The author explored the self-image further and found more evidence that it is vital to someone's personality and behavior. Although psychology acknowledged the self-image's role, it didn't adequately explain how it creates change or what happens in the nervous system. The author found answers in cybernetics, the study of goal-oriented systems and behavior. Cybernetics explains the mechanics of purposeful behavior in both machines and humans. The author believes in exploring various fields for truth, not just one's area of expertise. Although a plastic surgeon, he studied psychology and cybernetics to understand how self-image transforms personality. His unorthodox approach led to groundbreaking discoveries about the self-image's power to create change. However, these discoveries were so radical that the author feared criticism for sharing them. Still, improving self-image was so life-changing that the author felt compelled to share this knowledge. The key message is that one's self-image plays a pivotal role in their personality, behavior, and life experiences. Improving self-image can lead to profound life changes, though it requires work. Altering physical appearance alone is not enough. One must reconstruct their mental image of themselves for change to take hold. Psychology lacked a satisfactory explanation for simple human actions like picking up a pen. Cybernetics, the study of systems and control processes, enabled a breakthrough. The breakthrough came from outside psychology, as outdoor perspectives often yield new insights. The self-image determines personality, behavior, and accomplishments. Improving your self-image can expand your capabilities and turn failures into successes. There are healthy and unhealthy personality types, and self-image psychology explains them. The brain and nervous system work to achieve your goals, for better or worse. They function as a success mechanism or failure mechanism, depending on your self-image and the goals you set. Cybernetics shows that humans use machines but are not machines themselves. Self-image is changed through experience, not just knowledge. Real life experiences can be harsh teachers but imagined experiences work too. Your nervous system can't distinguish real from vividly imagined experiences. Imagined experiences can be used systematically to acquire skills and change behaviors. This book provides information to experience actively through exercises, imagination, analysis, and memory, not just passive reading. Actively engaging the info by doing summaries, relating examples to your life, and practicing exercises causes new neural patterns to form enabling fundamental change. Don't get discouraged if you don't see immediate results from the techniques in this book. It takes at least 21 days of practice to effect meaningful change. The methods can yield life-changing improvements to your self-image and experiences with ongoing training. In summary, this book proposes using the concepts and techniques of cybernetics and self-image psychology, involving vividly imagined experiences, to systematically retrain your brain and nervous system to achieve the goals and personality changes you desire. With dedicated practice over time, these methods can expand your self-image and turn your success mechanism in a healthier direction. 
It takes around 21 days for people to adjust to significant changes in their lives, whether physical changes from plastic surgery, amputation, or mental changes from moving to a new home. The author recommends reserving judgment about the ideas in the book for 21 days while doing the recommended exercises with an open mind. This allows time for your mental image to change and new ideas to feel comfortable. The author defines success as accomplishing goals stemming from your needs and talents, not from trying to achieve status symbols or meet others' expectations. Achieving success in this way leads to happiness and satisfaction. Our self-image is our mental picture of the kind of person we are. It's built from our life experiences, beliefs about ourselves, and how others have reacted to us. It is the foundation for our personality, behavior, experiences, abilities, and circumstances. We always act by our self-image. We can't work otherwise through willpower alone. Our experiences then reinforce our self-image, creating a cycle. The self-image can be changed, allowing us to live new lives. Efforts at change are most effective when directed at our core self-image rather than specific habits, circumstances, or character defects. When our self-image changes, related changes come quickly. Positive thinking alone usually doesn't work for change because it's often directed at external factors or surface-level character issues rather than our underlying self-image. But with a changed self-image, positive changes flow naturally. The psychologist David Leckie theorized that a person's self-conception could influence their learning ability and motivation. Leckie, a school teacher, tested this theory on thousands of his students. He found that when students had trouble understanding a subject, it was often because learning it would conflict with their view of themselves. However, when he helped students change their self-conception, their attitude and performance would also change. Leckie described cases where students went from failing to excelling after changing their self-image. For example, one student went from misspelling 55 out of 100 words and losing a year of credit to becoming one of the best spellers and earning a 91 average. Leckie used the same approach to cure students of habits like nail-biting and stuttering. The author cites similar cases from his own experience. For example, a man who was afraid to leave his house became a public speaker, a struggling salesman became the top salesperson, and a minister overcoming nerves and stress tripled his workload. The author, a plastic surgeon, became interested in self-image through his work. He was struck by how facial surgeries could lead to dramatic changes in personality and attitude. People's lives were transformed, shy people became outgoing, a moronic boy became intelligent, a criminal reformed, and salespeople regained confidence. However, some patients did not change as expected. The author could not determine why some surgeries had life-changing effects while others did not. Some patients even denied that their appearance had changed at all. The author noted that not all scars or disfigurements cause distress. For some, like German students and New Orleans Creoles, scars were a mark of status. This showed him that a person's reaction depends on their self-image, not just their physical appearance. Some people seek plastic surgery to fix imagined flaws, not actual deformities. Many normal-looking people, especially young women, become convinced that they are ugly due to a perceived imperfection or desire to look like celebrities. The author argues that their underlying self-image, not appearance, must change. In summary, the author explores how self-image shapes personality, behavior, motivation, and ability. Plastic surgery case studies showed him how self-image, not physical appearance alone, determines a person's happiness and success. The passage discusses people who see themselves as abnormal, different, or defective in some way, whether in appearance or otherwise. Surveys show many people feel ashamed of their appearance, even if nothing is wrong with it. These feelings of shame and inadequacy act like physical disfigurements and prevent people from living fully and freely. The critical factor in living a satisfying life is having a self-image you find acceptable and can feel good about. When your self-image is healthy, you feel self-confident and free to be yourself. When it is damaged or shameful, you feel anxious, insecure, and blocked from creative expression. The author became a plastic surgeon but realized patients needed psychological help as much as or more than surgery. He found that most people want to experience more life, happiness, and success. While much psychology focuses on humanity's tendencies towards self-destruction, there is also a life instinct in all of us working toward health, happiness, and more life. Recent insights show the subconscious mind is not a separate mind but an impersonal goal-achieving mechanism, like a cybernetic servo mechanism. It works to achieve whatever goals and mental images we provide, whether success and happiness or unhappiness and failure. The critical goal is our self-image, which determines how much we can achieve. We feed this mechanism information through our thoughts, beliefs, and interpretations. 
It uses stored memories to respond to current situations. The program for living fully involves learning to use this mechanism as a success rather than a failure mechanism. This means developing an adequate self-image and using creative mental imagery, imagination, and new habit patterns to achieve goals. The methods are simple but require practice and experience. They are no more complicated than remembering, worrying, or tying your shoes. The key is acting and thinking in new ways. Dr. Maltz points out that we have a built-in success mechanism that functions like a servo mechanism an automatic goal-seeking device. This mechanism steers us to accomplish goals and solve problems. We can direct this mechanism through visualization and imagination. Even a tiny memory of success or accomplishment can activate this mechanism and improve our self-image. We do not need a huge victory or success that mirrors what we want to achieve. Any memory of mastery or competence, no matter how small, provides positive feedback that we can achieve goals and be successful. Our success mechanism works in two ways. One, when we have a clear goal or target, it directs us toward achieving that goal like a guided missile system. Two, when we do not have a clear goal or solution, it functions to help us discover the solution or path forward, like a search mechanism. In both cases, it needs, one, a target or goal, either known or unknown, two, a means of propulsion toward the target, three, feedback to know if it's on the course or needs correction. It does not need a reaction to positive feedback, only a response to negative feedback to get back on course. The key points, one, we have a built-in success mechanism, two, we can direct it through imagination and visualization, three, even small memories of success or mastery can activate it, four, it works to achieve known goals or discover unknown solutions, five, it needs a target means of progress, and feedback a case history could be like learning to ride a bike for the first time. The success of mastering riding the bike, however imperfectly, provides a memory you can draw on to activate your success mechanism for other goals. The sense of achievement and competence is more important than how well you rode the bike. Achieving a goal requires an automatic mechanism to detect errors through feedback and make corrections. This is analogous to how a torpedo achieves its target by making course corrections. Picking up a pen is an example of an automatic mechanism in humans guided by sensory feedback. Conscious thoughts only select the goal and trigger the action. The robotic agent controls the muscle movements and makes corrections based on feedback. As we learn a skill, the corrections become more refined. Once we have achieved the goal successfully, we remember and can repeat that successful response habitually without conscious thought. Solving problems or recalling forgotten information also relies on an automatic scanning mechanism in the brain that searches through stored memories until a match is found. Computers similarly solve problems by scanning stored data to find an answer that fits the conditions of the problem. The human brain resembles a servo mechanism in how it functions. It has been found that the brain contains a recording mechanism that can vividly recall and re-experience experience past sensory experiences in detail. The brain's colossal storage and processing capacity far surpasses any existing computers. Simple acts that require complex computing, like catching a fly ball, are accomplished automatically without conscious thought. The brain takes sensory data, compares it to past experiences, computes, and issues motor commands in a flash. While science can build computers, we cannot yet construct an electronic brain comparable to the human brain. And even if we could, it would lack qualities like imagination, emotion, intuition, and self-direction that humans possess. Some thinkers believe that individual human minds tap into a universal mind or source of knowledge beyond our senses and experiences. Experimental evidence for parapsychological phenomena like telepathy, clairvoyance, and precognition suggests that humans can access information by extrasensory means. Extrasensory capacity and intuition can provide knowledge of the objective world and the subjective experiences of others. Many artists and psychologists note the similarity between creative insight and remembering something forgotten. Searching for new ideas or solutions to problems resembles searching one's memory for forgotten information, assuming the key exists but needs discovery. The creative process often taps into a universal store of knowledge. Examples like Louis Agassiz solving a fossil puzzle in a dream suggest accessing a collective unconscious. Repeatedly reading about one's built-in success mechanism and capacity for intuition can help change a self-image of lack or inadequacy. Though willpower alone may not work, recognizing one's inherent engineering for success and access to greater power can allow a new self-image to form. Basic principles for how one's success mechanism works include, 1. Having a clear goal or target ideally seen as already achieved in potential or actual form. The mechanism works by steering toward an existing plan or discovering something existing. 2. Operating based on results and ultimate goals. Don't worry about means or steps, which will come from focusing on the end goal. 
3. Allowing for mistakes and temporary failures. Success comes through trial and error with constant course correction. 4. Learning through repetition of successful responses, forgetting past errors. 5. Trusting one's creative mechanism by not forcing or overdirecting it. Though its workings remain below conscious awareness, it will operate according to present needs as a person acts based on faith in the mechanism. Proof comes from acting as if the power is already there. Imagination plays a vital role in success and problem solving. Recognizing its power and using techniques to tap into it can allow people to overcome self-imposed limitations or find new solutions and ideas. We have goals and use our imagination whether we realize it or not. We can use our imagination constructively or destructively. Our imagination determines our actions and behaviors. We act based on what we imagine to be true about ourselves and our environment. There is no difference in our nervous system's reaction between an imagined experience and a real one. Our body reacts similarly to what we think or imagine to be true. Hypnosis works by convincing people that the hypnotist's words are valid. Subjects then behave differently because they think and believe differently. There is no mysterious power involved. We need to react automatically to our environment to survive. But we respond based on our mental images and beliefs about the environment, not the environment itself. Our feelings and behaviors result from our mental images and beliefs. If these are distorted, our reactions will be inappropriate. We can practice new traits and attitudes by imagining ourselves acting a certain way. Mental practice helps make perfect. Experiments show cognitive approach improves skills similarly to physical exercise. The ability to cross a threshold, like throwing 90 miles per hour, is more mental than physical. Mental exercises like visualization and relaxation can help achieve such goals. The key message is that we can shape our realities and achieve our goals by managing our imagination and mental images. We must make a habit of constructive imagination rather than destructive creativity. Baseball players had difficulty hitting 90 miles per hour until they imagined themselves hitting that speed. After visualizing it, their self-image changed, and hitting 90 miles per hour became much more accessible. A chess champion named Alakine repeatedly lost to Capablanca. To prepare for their next match, Alakine spent months imagining himself playing Capablanca and winning. He ended up defeating Capablanca. Salespeople who visualize themselves overcoming objections and closing sales significantly increase their sales, visualization helped them become spontaneous and confident. A psychologist named Marston recommended rehearsal practice, imagining yourself in a situation like a job interview. Even though the questions may differ, it builds confidence and the ability to react spontaneously. A famous pianist named Schnabel rarely practiced at his piano. He said he practiced in his head by visualizing himself playing. A violinist struggled and thought he needed to retire due to an injury. After visualizing himself playing well, he gave the best concert of his life and decided not to quit. The golfer Ben Hogan would visualize each shot perfectly before hitting the ball. He relied on muscle memory to then hit the shot well. A golf teacher named Morrison taught people to lower their scores through visualization alone. Successful people like Napoleon and Conrad Hilton used visualization to achieve their goals and success. Visualization works because the brain and body act as a servo mechanism, an automatic goal-seeking machine. To function, it needs a target. Visualization gives the brain a mark that can steer the body to achieve. In summary, many successful people have used visualization and mental imagery to achieve goals, improve skills, and enhance performance. By providing the mind and body with a target to work toward, Visualization allows a person to develop the self-image and confidence necessary to accomplish things that otherwise seem out of reach. You must first clearly visualize something in your mind before you can achieve it. Once you have a clear mental image, your creative success mechanism will take over and help you achieve it more effectively than conscious effort alone. Rather than straining with willpower and worry, relax, visualize your desired outcome, and let your success mechanism guide you. It would help if you still took action but your efforts will be focused on progress rather than mental conflict. This exact mechanism can help transform your personality if you visualize the person you want to become. Seeing yourself in a new way is critical to change. The goal is not an unrealistic overinflated self-image but an accurate one. Most people underestimate themselves. You can determine the truth about yourself based on the premise that a loving creator would not make inferior beings or want them to fail. You were made in God's image and meant to succeed and fulfill your purpose. Replace an inadequate self-image with an accurate one using visualization and imagination. Picture yourself as you want to be for 30 minutes a day. Make the images vivid by paying close attention to details. See yourself acting and feeling the way you want to. Your nervous system will respond as if it's happening. With practice, 
your new mental images can become a reality as your behavior and feelings change accordingly. But the key is first to see it in your mind. The main ideas are that visualization and imagination have potent effects, you must change your self-image to change your reality, and you were meant to thrive, not struggle. You can develop an empowering self-image and become your best self with discipline and practice. Here is a summary of the key points. 1. False beliefs can powerfully influence a person's behavior and abilities. The story of Alfred Adler illustrates how his opinion that he was dumb in mathematics affected his performance in that subject. 2. A businessman was unable to excel at public speaking because of his belief that he did not have an impressive appearance and would fail to impress his audience. He overcame this by believing he had an important message to deliver regardless of his arrival. 3. People can be hypnotized by false beliefs they have accepted from various sources, even if they have never been formally hypnotized. These beliefs have the same power over them as the hypnotist's words have over a hypnotized subject. 4. Poor performance in school is often due to students' self-conceptions and self-definitions, such as I am dumb or I am a poor speller. These beliefs compel the students to perform poorly to be consistent with their self-image. 5. A salesman was stuck earning $5,000 a year because that was his self-evaluation and self-image. He worked less when given a better territory, so he stayed within that amount. When given a poor environment, he worked harder to reach $5,000. His performance was more determined by his self-concept than the actual conditions. 6. Mr. Russell aged 20 years overnight because he believed an operation cost him his life savings. He quickly regained his youthful appearance and vitality when he learned the truth. False beliefs can dramatically impact a person's physical and emotional well-being. The key message is that false beliefs, especially those regarding our self-concept and abilities, can be hypnotic in their power over us. Recognizing and overcoming these false beliefs is essential to achieving our full potential and living a fulfilling life. Mr. Russell spent a lot of money on his girlfriend, D, and she claimed to love him. However, she said she couldn't marry him because his lower lip was too big. When Mr. Russell got surgery to fix his lip and show D, she got furious. She said she had never loved him, she had just used him for his money. In her anger, she also put a voodoo curse on him. Even though Mr. Russell was educated and cultured, he felt uncomfortable after the curse. Soon, he found a strange bump in his mouth, and a friend told him it was the African bug, which would drain away his health and strength. Mr. Russell started believing this and noticed signs of declining health and strength. He lost his appetite, couldn't sleep, lost 30 pounds, and aged dramatically. Mr. Russell went back to the doctor. The doctor examined him, removed the bump, just scar tissue, and showed it to Mr. Russell. Once Mr. Russell realized the truth, he immediately started to recover. His posture and expression changed, and he looked years younger. His health and vitality were restored. This story shows the power of belief. Ideas we accept as accurate, whether from others or ourselves, have the same effect as hypnosis. Many people are hypnotized by the negative thoughts they have taken. These ideas can limit our abilities, just like the hypnotist's suggestions to the athletes. However, just as hypnosis can remove these blocks, Realizing the truth can dehypnotize us and allow us to achieve more. Most people suffer from feelings of inferiority to some degree. However, inferiority comes from how we judge and evaluate ourselves, not necessarily facts. We feel inferior when we compare ourselves to unrealistic norms or standards, like comparing ourselves to exceptionally skilled people. But everyone is terrible in some areas and superior in others. We must measure ourselves against our potential and abilities not unrealistic standards or the skills of exceptional people. Then, we can overcome feelings of inferiority. The key idea is that feelings of inferiority arise from comparing ourselves to unrealistic norms and standards rather than accepting ourselves as unique individuals. This erroneous thinking leads to striving for superiority to overcome feelings of inferiority, creating a vicious cycle of misery. The solution is to realize the following truths. 1. You are not inferior or superior, you are you you are unique and unlike any other person. 2. There are no fixed standards common to everybody else. Everyone is different. 3. God created each person as unique, not copies of a standard person. 4. Inferiority feelings can be created in experiments by setting up unrealistic norms that people feel they do not measure up to. 5. Relaxation and letting go of effort are vital to overcoming negative habits and beliefs. Using willpower often backfires. Six. Forming clear mental images of the desired result, and practicing relaxation toward reaching that goal, is an effective method for change. 7. Both positive practice, refraining from a habit, and negative practice, 
intentionally engaging in a pattern, can be helpful as long as the desired goal is kept in mind. The relaxation exercise uses visualization of heavy, concrete limbs and a limp marionette doll to promote deep relaxation. The key is letting your creative mechanism take over to realize the goal of peace rather than using effort. With regular practice, ease becomes more accessible and more profound. In summary, the inferiority complex and its misery is a vicious cycle arising from erroneous thinking that can be overcome by accepting our uniqueness, letting go of unrealistic standards, and practicing relaxation and visualization. We are each creatively made individuals, not copies of some ideal everybody else. Many people are disappointed to hear that rational thinking effectively changes negative beliefs and behaviors. But it does work, and it is scientifically valid. Your unconscious or automatic mind is impersonal and reacts based on the data and beliefs you feed it consciously. Conscious thinking is the control mechanism for your unconscious reactions. Harmful and inappropriate reaction patterns were developed through conscious thought and can be changed through conscious thought. According to Dr. John Schindler, present thinking that produces enjoyment and maturity is critical to overcoming past problems. Constantly dwelling on the past is counterproductive. Learning any skill, including social skills, involves making errors, recognizing them, and correcting them to achieve the desired goal. Mistakes are meant as a means to an end, not the end goal itself. Once the errors have served their purpose, they should be forgotten. Dwelling on past mistakes or failures makes them the dream you hold in your mind and imagination. One patient tortured herself by constantly reliving and criticizing herself for her unhappy past, destroying her chance for present happiness. She had to learn to stop condemning herself for her past to live happily. Critically criticizing yourself for past mistakes perpetuates the problems rather than solves them. It is better to learn from your errors and then forget them, focusing on the present and future goals. The key points are, 1. Rational thinking can effectively change beliefs and behaviors. 2. Your unconscious mind responds to your conscious thoughts and beliefs. 3. Learn from past mistakes and errors, then forget them. 4. Dwelling on the past perpetuates problems, live in the present. 5. Criticizing yourself for past failures does not help, learn and move on. Do not dwell on past failures or let them negatively affect your current performance. Your past failures do not dictate your future outcomes. Your conscious mind gives power to the past by drawing false conclusions. Hypnosis shows that people can instantly change their behavior and reaction patterns when they are made to believe something different. When subjects are told they are bold and confident, they act that way. Their attention is focused on the new belief, not past failures. Dorothea Brandt found success as a writer by acting as if she could not fail. She ignored her past failures and access talents she did not know she had. Bertrand Russell overcame his tendency towards remorse and unhappiness by focusing outward, diminishing his preoccupation with himself and refusing to dwell on his sins or shortcomings. Russell recommended overcoming irrational beliefs by closely examining them and rejecting them. Do not pause between rationality and irrationality. Have vivid and emphatic conscious ideas that make an impression on your unconscious. Ideas are changed not by willpower but by other ideas. Examining inconsistent beliefs and seeing their absurdity helps overcome them. Two powerful ways to change beliefs are recognizing that you can hold up your end, do your share, and not tolerate indignities in your self-concept. Examine your beliefs and ask yourself if there are rational reasons for them. See if you have assumed or concluded things without cause. Ask if the same idea would apply to others in your situation. Do not continue acting on unreasonable beliefs. Trace negative behaviors and feelings back to the underlying beliefs. Ask why? To determine if the ideas are facts or assumptions. Challenge assumptions and false conclusions. Get emotional about the ways they have limited you. Let anger free you of them. Clarence Darrow and a businessman friend became successful after an indignant experience motivated them to prove doubters wrong. Their desire and determination fueled their success. While rational thought is essential for evaluating situations and selecting goals, deep feelings, and desires are necessary to change beliefs and behavior. Worry demonstrates how constantly dwelling on a positive or negative possibility can make it seem more real and generate corresponding emotions. We can harness this tendency by focusing on desirable outcomes instead of undesirable ones. The automatic mechanism processes the input we provide without judgment. It reacts to achieve the goals we set, whether success or failure. Rational thought should feed it accurate information and help form constructive beliefs and evaluations. Many underestimate themselves and overestimate difficulties, freezing progress. Speaking with friends shows you have the ability for public speaking, you need to expand that image to a bigger group. Only assume you will succeed with evidence. 
Rational thought should examine incoming messages and reject untrue ones. It should select goals and concentrate on them rather than what you don't want. It should keep you focused on the current situation, so your automatic mechanism has the necessary input to respond appropriately. However, rational thought alone does not produce results or force creativity. We must trust in our built-in creative abilities, do our work, and let results unfold. In summary, we have a success mechanism and creative abilities that will function automatically if we provide the correct input and environment. Excessive worry and conscious effort often inhibit this natural process. By relaxing, focusing on our goals, and trusting in our abilities, we can achieve more with less stress. The forebrain or conscious mind is like the operator of a computer. It can observe, gather information, and identify problems, but it cannot solve problems or create on its own. Modern society relies too heavily on conscious thought and effort. This leads to anxiety, tension, and diminished creativity. The advice to take no thought for tomorrow and be careful in nothing means we should relax our conscious effort and let our unconscious mind work. This leads to greater creativity and effectiveness. Creativity comes from the unconscious mind, not conscious effort. Writers, inventors, and others report that ideas come spontaneously when the conscious mind is relaxed and not actively focused on a problem. To access the unconscious mind and enhance creativity, relax conscious effort after gathering information and defining a problem. Engage in an activity like walking, driving, or showering. Also, ask your mind to work on the issue while sleeping and write down any insights upon awakening. The unconscious creativity that produces insights for writers and inventors is available to everyone for any life challenge or pursuit. We can all access this success mechanism. Skill and fluent performance also come from the unconscious mind, not conscious control or effort. Conscious thinking about how to do something inhibits the smooth and natural performance that comes from the unconscious mind and practice. In summary, the key to creativity, skill, and effective action is relaxing conscious control and allowing the unconscious mind to do its work. Conscious effort jams our creative machinery. Non-conscious processing and intuition lead to the aha. Moments and spontaneous skills we seek. The key message is to focus on the journey and process, not just the goal or outcome. Spending too much time visualizing the result can inhibit your progress because you need to take action now. Successful people focus on the steps that must be taken daily to achieve the goal. They take it day by day, moment by moment. There are five rules to freeing your creative mechanism. 1. Do your worrying before you take action, not after. Figure out the risks and determine the best course of action before starting the process. Once you start, let go of the worries and doubts. 2. Focus on the present moment. Your creative mechanism can only function in the present, so be responsive to the current environment and situation. Make plans for the future but live in the now. 3. Live in day-tight compartments. Don't dwell on the past or future. Focus on living well today. 4. Become more consciously aware of the present moment. Notice the details in your surrounding environment using all your senses. Be alert and attentive to the here and now. This helps reduce anxiety and restlessness. 5. React to the present reality, not to fiction from the past. Your creative mechanism is designed to respond to the current environment. Don't react automatically based on past events. See the present situation for what it is. The fundamental principles are living in the present, being responsive to current circumstances, and not dwelling on the past or worrying excessively about the future. Take life day by day and avoid inhibitions to your creative mechanism. Focus on the journey, that's how goals are achieved and progress is made. Don't react to current situations as if they were events from your past. See the present situation for what it is. Focus on one thing at a time. Try to avoid mentally juggling multiple tasks simultaneously. Our minds can only truly focus on one thing at a time. Sleep on it when you are stuck on a problem. Our creative mind works best when our conscious mind is not interfering. Let your subconscious work on the problem overnight. Practice recalling a feeling of relaxation and calm. This can help reduce fatigue and anxiety allowing you to tap into your creative mechanism better. Make developing a relaxed attitude a habit. Success comes from concentrating on one goal or task at a time, not focusing on everything at once. Start the fire of desire for one goal, and that focused motivation will spread to other goals. The key themes are, avoid reacting to current events as if they were past traumatic events, focus your mind on one thing at a time, relax and let your subconscious work on problems, make developing a relaxed, focused attitude a habit and motivate yourself by focusing on one goal at a time. Here are the key points to remember from this chapter. 1. Happiness is good for your health and well-being. 
It improves your thinking, performance, health, and relationships. 2. Happiness is a habit and mental attitude you can cultivate. It is not something you earn or deserve. 3. Pursuing happiness is not selfish. It enables you to be unselfish and help others. Unhappiness is what is selfish and mean. 4. Happiness comes from living in the present, not in the expectation of some future event. Life's problems will always exist, so you must choose to be happy now. 5. You have the power to choose your reactions and attitudes. Don't be a slave to outward events and the manipulations of others. Take control of your happiness. Your case history, describe a time in your life when you were waiting to be happy until some future event occurred, only to find that you were no more comfortable when you achieved it. Explain how cultivating an attitude of happiness in the present could have improved the experience. Discuss what you learned from that experience that you now apply to your life. Happiness is a choice and an attitude, not something that happens to you. You can choose to be happier by controlling your thoughts and attitudes. It's not the events that make you unhappy, but your opinions and interpretations. You can be happier by not adding negative views to the facts. Maintain an aggressive, goal-oriented attitude. Having purpose and striving toward goals leads to happiness. Loss of goals and a passive attitude leads to unhappiness. Practice healthy-mindedness. Deliberately focus on the good and maintain pleasant thoughts. You can systematically train yourself to be happier by practicing optimistic thinking. Both good and evil exist in the world. You choose what to focus on, so you can focus on the good and be happy or on the bad and unhappy. It's a matter of selection and choice. Pleasant memories and thoughts of good times can help shift your mood and make you feel happier. Use them as a resource. Avoid negative and unpleasant thoughts. Cut them out and redirect your mind to more constructive ideas. Your thinking has power over your happiness and outcomes. The stories illustrate these principles. The salesman turned around his situation by changing his thoughts for 30 days. The boxer overcame fear and anxiety by redirecting his mind away from negative thoughts. We have the power to determine our beliefs and attitudes. The salesperson's sales were increasing steadily. His boss had congratulated him publicly in a sales meeting. To improve your personality and become successful. 1. Develop a success type personality. The ingredients are, a positive, optimistic mindset, high frustration tolerance, responsibility for one's happiness and success, flexibility and adaptability, getting the important things done, prioritizing and avoiding procrastination, continuous self-improvement, reading, taking courses, listening to audio, good health and energy level, good interpersonal relationships too. Model the personality and habits of successful people. Take a systematic approach to self-improvement by setting clear goals and deadlines. 3. Practice successful habits and new behavior patterns until they become automatic. 95% of behavior is habitual, so you must work to change bad habits and form good ones. 4. Have a clear vision of what you want to accomplish and who you want to become. The guidance mechanism in your mind needs a concrete goal to work towards. 5. Learn to apply these principles to business, career, and all life areas. Develop an overall optimistic and success-promoting mindset. Those are the key points I picked up from the summary. The case history mentions how providing a clear goal and model of a successful personality helped many of the author's patients to improve themselves. New roles or situations often require developing a new self-image to feel comfortable and confident. Two examples, an ad man felt insecure after a promotion despite wanting and working for it. He felt like an imposter in the new role and thought plastic surgery might help. The issue was not his looks but his self-image. A stay-at-home mom felt irritated with her family and thought a facelift might make them appreciate her more. Again, the issue was her self-image, not her looks. To develop a successful self-image, focus on the letters in success, S, have a sense of direction and set goals to work toward. Without goals, people feel aimless and purposeless. Had both personal and impersonal goals. U, develop understanding. Communication and seeing situations accurately are key. React based on facts, not opinions. Be willing to know the truth, even if unpleasant. C. Have the courage to see the truth and make changes. C. Show compassion for others and see their perspectives. E. Build self-esteem by accepting yourself and not lying to yourself. S. Develop confidence in yourself by seeing your abilities and past successes. S. Learn to accept yourself as you are. Nobody's perfect, so accept both strengths and weaknesses. In summary, Develop new self-images through setting goals, improving understanding, and building courage, confidence, compassion, esteem, and self-acceptance. With work, you can create a successful self-image to match any new role or situation.
Courage, goals and understanding a situation are not enough, you must act courageously. Action translates beliefs and desires into realities. The best defense is a potent offense, confront problems, don't dodge them. Dare to risk mistakes and failure, stepping in the wrong direction is better than standing still. Compassion, successful people have compassion for others. They respect others' dignity and humanity. How we view others reflects how we consider ourselves. Judging others harshly judges ourselves. Forgiving others helps us forgive ourselves. We must think of others' feelings and needs. Treating others well helps us feel better about them and ourselves. Self-esteem, doubting yourself is the deadliest trap. It punishes us and stifles social progress. Low self-opinion is a vice, not a virtue. It causes problems like jealousy and insecurity. Stop seeing yourself as worthless and an object of pity. Use exercises to build self-image. Esteem means to appreciate your worth. Value yourself as God's creation. The secret to self-esteem, appreciate others more. Show them respect as God's creatures. Valuing others raises your self-esteem. Genuine esteem comes from appreciating yourself for who you are, God's child. So value all people as God's creatures. The key to building self-confidence is experiencing success and focusing on past successes rather than failures. Our brains are programmed to reinforce success and forget the loss. Yet many people do the opposite and dwell on past failures, eroding their self-confidence. Remembering and visualizing past successes is important, no matter how small. Everyone has succeeded at something. Recalling these moments can help restore self-confidence. For true success and happiness, we need self-acceptance. We must accept ourselves as we are, imperfections and all. Many people are miserable because they constantly try to be something they are not. Success comes from being yourself, not from trying to be somebody else. You are somebody because of who you are, not what you have accomplished. Yourself or true nature cannot be changed, only realized and expressed. A better self-image does not create new abilities, it releases powers you already have. You can change your personality and habits, but not your core self. Do not mistake yourself for your mistakes and imperfections. You may make mistakes, but you are not a mistake. Faults belong to you, but they are not you. We must recognize our defects to correct them, but we should not hate ourselves because of them. The actual self, how we express ourselves, is always imperfect and evolving. Accept the true self, our only vehicle. Those who reject the authentic self for an imaginary ideal self court frustration and disappointment. Accept yourself as you are and start from there. Learn to tolerate imperfection in yourself. Recognize defects but do not hate yourself for them. You are not worthless just because you make mistakes. No one is perfect. Differentiate between yourself and your behavior. You are somebody right now, imperfect as you may be. Accept yourself for having typical human desires and imperfections. Your worth does not matter how well you fulfill society's images and standards. You matter because you exist. The author argues that we must recognize negative traits and failure symptoms in ourselves to correct them. No one chooses to develop these traits deliberately. Instead, we adopt them mistakenly, thinking they will solve our problems. We can overcome them by gaining insight into the fact that they do not work and are inappropriate. The traits that make up the failure mechanism are, frustration, feeling that arises when an important goal is blocked. Chronic frustration means your goals are unrealistic or your self-image is inadequate. Practical purposes and accepting imperfection help alleviate it. Aggressiveness, misdirected aggressiveness often follows frustration. It is a mistaken way to overcome frustration and solve problems that do not work. Insecurity, comes from a poor self-image and a lack of confidence in your ability to deal with challenges. Building competence and focusing outward help. Loneliness, comes from a lack of meaningful relationships and purpose. Developing intimate relationships and contributing to others help overcome it. Uncertainty, indecision and lack of purpose or meaning. Gaining purpose and direction through worthwhile goals and action help overcome uncertainty. Resentment, bitterness towards others who have what you want or who have wronged you. Forgiveness and focusing outward help alleviate irritation. Emptiness, feeling of meaninglessness arising from lack of purpose or strong values. Finding purpose and meaning through worthwhile goals and values help. The failure mechanism was adopted to solve problems, but it did not work. Gaining insight into the fact that these traits do not work and are inappropriate can help us overcome them. The drive to react appropriately that led us to adopt them will work to eradicate them once we have this insight. Aggressiveness is a natural and necessary human trait that helps achieve goals and motivation. However, it becomes a problem when misdirected or frustrated, leading to destructive behavior. The failure type personality does not channel aggressiveness properly leading to adverse outcomes like health issues, irritability, 
nagging, etc. They may also have unrealistic goals and try harder when faced with failure, leading to more frustration. Understanding and managing aggressiveness are critical. It should be directed at proper goals and channels like exercise, hobbies, social interactions, etc. Recognizing the underlying cause of the frustration can help diffuse aggressive feelings. Insecurity stems from a perception of inner inadequacy, often due to unrealistic expectations of perfection or unrealistic comparisons to an ideal self. One should avoid thinking in absolutes and recognize that self-improvement is a continual process. Comparing yourself to unrealistic standards leads to a need to defend your ego and a loss of motivation for growth. Staying grounded and focusing on continual progress and goals, rather than an unrealistic perception of achieving an ideal status, helps overcome insecurity. Underdogs often succeed because they have something concrete to work toward. Loneliness comes from alienation from one's true self and life purpose. It leads to a vicious cycle of social isolation which only worsens the underlying issues. Overcoming loneliness involves rediscovering meaning and purpose, reconnecting with others through shared experiences, and dropping pretense. Social interaction helps one discover their authentic self. In summary, dealing with negative emotions involves recognizing their source, avoiding absolutist and unrealistic thinking, channeling motivation in a productive direction, and reconnecting with purpose and others. A continual learning and growth mindset leads to healthy and effective outcomes. The key points are, 1. Loneliness stems from a fear of others and a passive attitude that expects others to initiate social interactions. Forcing yourself into social situations and developing skills contributing to others can help overcome loneliness. 2. Uncertainty is avoiding mistakes and responsibility by not making decisions. Sometimes, it is only possible to be correct, and the most successful people make mistakes. Only small people never admit to being wrong. Make the best decision you can based on the information you have and correct it as needed. 3. Resentment blames outside factors for failures instead of taking responsibility. It is an attempt to change the past and leads to self-pity. Your reaction, not outside events, causes resentment. It creates an inferior self-image and prevents happiness and success. Release resentment by realizing life owes you nothing, and you must pursue your goals. 4. Success without enjoyment and meaning leads to an empty feeling. Enjoying life and finding meaning are more important than outward symbols of success. In summary, overcome loneliness by contributing to others, defeat uncertainty by accepting mistakes and making the best decision possible, release resentment by taking control of your reactions and pursuing your purpose, and find meaning to avoid emptiness. Developing self-reliance, responsibility, and enjoyment of life leads to overcoming these failure mechanisms. The capacity to enjoy life is still alive in someone who enjoys ordinary and simple things. He also wants his achievements and successes. A person unable to enjoy anything finds life dull and meaningless. Emptiness results from a lack of purpose or meaningful goals. When we have worthwhile goals to strive for, life becomes meaningful. Emptiness is not a healthy mindset and should not be used as an excuse to avoid responsibility. Emptiness is linked to a poor self-image. We have trouble accepting and enjoying things we do not deserve. Even after achieving success, a person with low self-esteem may feel unworthy and unable to enjoy it. While we should be aware of the negatives to avoid problems, we should focus on the positives. Glance at the negatives but focus on your goals and destination. Practice substituting positive thoughts for negative ones to build an automatic guidance system. We form emotional scars and become calloused in response to emotional hurts, but these scars often do more harm than good. Just as physical scars can be removed through surgery, emotional scars can be healed by removing their cause and restoring self-image and confidence. Healing emotional scars cured George T of his problems, not the physical plastic surgery alone. The key is to be sensitive to negatives but focus on positives. Take corrective action against negatives and work to achieve meaningful goals. Replace negative thoughts with positive ones. Remove the underlying causes of emotional scars and restore self-image to find healing. Emotional scars from past hurts can alienate people from life and relationships. To protect themselves from further pain, people may build emotional walls. However, these walls also cut them off from positive connections and experiences. There are three rules to prevent accumulating emotional scars. 1. Develop robust and healthy self-esteem so slights and insensitive comments less threaten you. Do not let small ego threats scar you. 2. Become more self-reliant rather than emotionally dependent on others. Focus on giving love as well as receiving it. Do not expect everyone to love and approve of you. 3. Relax and release emotional tensions to allow wounds to heal cleanly. Do not hold on to hurt and resentment, which leads to scarring.
In summary, emotional scars are not inevitable if you nurture your self-worth, take responsibility for yourself, and learn to let go of past hurts. These skills allow you to have healthier relationships and stay open to life's beauty. Emotional scars form when tension and anxiety present, just as physical scars form when pressure on the wound. If you can remain relaxed, emotional blows will not cause lasting harm. You alone are responsible for your emotional responses and reactions. You can choose not to respond and remain unhurt. Relaxation and thought control can help prevent emotional scars from forming. Old emotional scars can be removed through a process similar to plastic surgery. You must perform spiritual surgery on yourself to remove them. Forgiveness is the scalpel that can cut out emotional scars. True forgiveness involves completely forgetting the offense. Partial or insincere forgiveness does not heal the scar. Forgiveness should not be used as a weapon or to make you feel morally superior. Its purpose is healing and restoration. You must become willing to give up your grudges and sense of condemnation, just as you would agree to give up a gangrenous arm. As long as you hold on to resentment, you cannot forgive. You should forgive because you realize the debt is not valid or meaningful, not to be generous or do a favor. True forgiveness comes from seeing there was nothing really to forgive. In summary, emotional scars can be prevented and removed by practicing relaxation, thought control, and true forgiveness, which involves forgetting the offense and giving up resentment. Forgiveness is meant for healing, not judgment. When you reach the point of seeing the invalidity of the debt, you have achieved true forgiveness. The author attended a luncheon with clergy members who discussed Jesus forgiving the adulterous woman. However, the author points out that Jesus never forgave the woman. He merely told her that he did not condemn her and told her to sin no more. Forgiveness requires condemnation first, which Jesus did not do. True forgiveness, or therapeutic forgiveness, means not condemning others for their mistakes and instead seeing that we all make errors. We should not hate others or beat ourselves up over mistakes. We should not confuse a person's actions or behavior with their inherent self or being. Saying I failed recognizes a mistake, but saying I am a failure implies a counterproductive permanent state of being. To live creatively, we must be vulnerable and open ourselves up to potential hurt. We can either isolate ourselves to avoid hurt like an oyster or remain open to break but also open to joy, like turning the other cheek. Holding on to grudges and emotional scars makes us look and feel older. Letting go of them through forgiveness and an openness to life gives us a youthful spirit and appearance. Personality comes from within, not without. It expresses our authentic, creative selves, made in God's image. Unlike phoniness, which is off-putting, our authentic selves are magnetic and attractive. Babies are loved simply for who they are. Key points, 1. Jesus did not forgive the adulterous woman, he did not condemn her. 2. True forgiveness means not condemning others for their mistakes. 3. Do not confuse a person's actions with their inherent self. 4. Creativity requires being open to potential hurt. 5. Holding on to emotional scars makes us feel and appear older, letting go gives us a youthful spirit. 6. Personality comes from within and expresses our authentic, creative selves. The baby expresses his true feelings and emotions without inhibitions. He demonstrates what it means to be yourself. All humans have a personality that can be inhibited or freed and released. An inhibited character is restrained and does not express their true self. An uninhibited nature freely sounds the creative potential within. Excessive negative feedback, or overreaction to criticism, leads to inhibition. Effective negative feedback helps guide behavior and make corrections. Too much negative feedback stops behavior and progress. Stuttering is an example of how excessive negative feedback and inhibition interfere with an appropriate response. When stutterers' excessive self-criticism was reduced, their speech improved. Eliminating worry and extreme carefulness improved their performance. Purpose Tremor shows how excessive carefulness and anxiety lead to inhibition. Ordinary people and patients with specific brain injuries can experience uncontrollable shaking upon attempting a purposeful action. Relaxation techniques help reduce their stress and inhibition. Excessive carefulness and anxiety over making an error is a form of excessive negative feedback that inhibits expression. Reducing this anxiety and negative self-criticism disinhibits and frees the self. In summary, inhibition results from overreaction to negative feedback excess anxiety about mistakes, and excessive carefulness. Freeing and releasing one's personality requires reducing negative self-criticism, relaxing from stress and worry, and spontaneously and freely expressing one's true self. Excessive carefulness and anxiety about making mistakes or failing can inhibit performance and lead to deterioration. Being overly concerned with what others think and trying too hard to please them causes inhibition, poor performance, and rattledness. 
The key is developing an indifference or not caring so much about outcomes and what others think. This allows spontaneous and creative performance. Self-consciousness comes from being too sensitively attuned to negative feedback from others and worrying too much about their judgments. The way to overcome this is to act with the same spontaneity and indifference to outcomes as when alone. Focus on your thoughts and feelings, not what others may think about you. One example is a salesman who overcame his self-consciousness in formal dining situations by pretending to eat a casual meal with his parents. This allowed him to feel at ease. Another example is a psychologist who overcame his painful self-consciousness by developing more self-consciousness, focusing on his thoughts and feelings, not what others thought of him. This allowed him to become a successful public speaker and author. The key is disregarding what others may think of you and instead focusing on your spontaneous thoughts and feelings. This does not make you insensitive to others but allows you to perform at your best. In summary, excessive negative feedback and anxiety lead to poor performance and self-consciousness. The solution is developing an attitude of indifference to outcomes and judgment from others, which allows spontaneous, creative performance. Focus on your own experience rather than trying to please others. The author argues that an overly sensitive conscience, or excessive inhibition, can hamper happiness and success. While some degree of conscience is necessary for morality and ethics, too much inhibition causes problems. If one's beliefs about right and wrong are unrealistic or incorrect, following one's conscience can lead to trouble. The author gives several examples of how an overly sensitive conscience can develop from childhood experiences, such as being punished for self-expression. This can lead to feelings of stage fright or inadequacy in adulthood. To overcome excessive inhibition, the author recommends practicing disinhibition, being less careful, concerned, and conscientious. However, some degree of inhibition is still necessary for a functioning society. The key is finding the right balance of inhibition and disinhibition for well-being and success. Signs of too little inhibition include, getting into trouble due to overconfidence or impulsiveness. Never admitting when one is wrong. Talking excessively. Signs of too much inhibition include shyness, anxiety, nervousness, feelings of inadequacy, and hesitating to express oneself or take initiative. The author argues that most people struggle more with excessive inhibition and would benefit from purposefully ignoring inhibitions at times to build confidence and self-expression. In summary, the author believes that while conscience and inhibition have their place in ethics and society, an overly sensitive feedback mechanism can severely hinder one's happiness, relationships, and success in life. Practicing disinhibition and building self-confidence is critical to overcoming this problem and finding the right balance of restraint and self-expression. You have too much inhibition and caution. You overplan and worry too much about consequences. You must follow Ephesians' advice to be anxious for nothing. Some suggestions to overcome too much inhibition. 1. Speak without overthinking. Improvise. Don't plan what you will say. This is how servo mechanisms work, they act first and then correct. We have to act first before we can think. 2. Stop criticizing yourself. Refrain from analyzing everything you do and say. Some self-reflection is good, but constant self-criticism is defeating. Catch yourself doing it and stop. 3. Speak up. Inhibited people tend to be soft-spoken. Practice speaking louder. It can help disinhibit you. 4. Express positive feelings. Inhibited people are afraid to express positive and negative emotions. Compliment others. Say I love you to your spouse. Let people know you like them. 5. You can choose not to respond to external stimuli. You don't have to answer the phone or email. You can sit still and not react. Your responses are habits, and you can form new habits. See yourself not responding in your mind. 6. Extinguish condition anxiety responses. Many anxieties are learned responses to environmental bells. You can unlearn them by not responding to the bells. Relax instead of reacting. Tell yourself you don't have to respond. 7. If you can only partially ignore a response, delay it. This can still help extinguish the conditioning over time. Take deep breaths and count to 10 before reacting. The key is learning new habits of not corresponding to environmental stimuli. Relax, sit still, and see yourself not reacting in your mind. Break the habit of constant anxiety and self-criticism. Express yourself more to overcome inhibition. With practice, you can gain more peace of mind. People often respond automatically to stimuli based on conditioning and habit. However, sometimes the desire to avoid a push can feel overwhelming. Delaying your response to a stimulus can help break the habit loop and allow you to respond more thoughtfully. Techniques like counting to 10, deep breathing, and relaxation can help delay a response.
Relaxation erects a psychic screen that blocks disturbing stimuli from eliciting an automatic response. Relaxation is a natural tranquilizer that can help you maintain a peaceful attitude. Building a quiet room in your imagination, a place of peace and tranquility, can help you decompress from stresses and recharge. Retreating into this space, even for a few minutes, can provide respite and renewal. Some escapism and protection from constant external stimulation are healthy for your nervous system. A quiet mental room provides a little vacation and releases from pressures and worries. Visual imagery, like picturing emotional pressure releasing like steam from a geyser, can effectively decompress your imagination. Clearing your mind before undertaking a new problem or task can help you start fresh without the influence of past, unrelated situations. Letting go of residual thoughts and feelings from previous experiences increases clarity and focus. Inner disturbance is usually caused by overreacting or being overly sensitive to environmental stimuli. You can create tranquility by not responding or letting the telephone ring. You can overcome habits of overreacting by delaying automatic responses and practicing non-response. Relaxation is a natural tranquilizer. Learn physical relaxation through practice. Then when you need to be non-responsive in daily life, do what you do when you relax. Use the quiet room in your mind technique as a tranquilizer to prepare your mind for different situations. Spend a few moments relaxed and clear your mind. This can help you transition between work and home or handle frustrating phone calls. Fear, anger, anxiety, and other emotions can carry over from one situation to the next if you don't clear your mind. But calmness and tranquility can also carry over if you practice non-response. Many accidents and mistakes are caused by emotional carryover. Clearing your mind can help prevent this. You can create your own psychic umbrella by practicing non-response. This can shield you from disturbing stimuli and bring more peace of mind. Remember that your response to a situation determines your feelings, not the problem itself. You can choose not to respond to maintain tranquility. Don't respond emotionally to imaginary straw men that you worry may exist. Only respond to the actual current situation. Live in the present moment. Analyze your environment and respond spontaneously to what exists rather than worrying about what might be. Keep your focus on the current moment. Some people perform better in crises, while others choke under pressure. Those who perform better in crises have learned how to react appropriately. They have, 1. Practice the necessary skills without too much pressure. Learning under intense pressure leads to narrow, rigid responses. Practicing in normal, low-pressure conditions allows for developing flexible skills and strategies. 2. Learn to react to crises with an aggressive, solution-focused attitude rather than a defensive one. They focus on the challenge rather than the threat. 3. Learn to evaluate crises objectively and not overreact. They do not see small challenges as catastrophic. Crises can either empower or debilitate people depending on how they react. Reacting well to crises involves learning critical skills in advance, focusing on solutions rather than threats, and evaluating situations objectively. With practice, Problems can become opportunities for growth rather than sources of fear or panic. Examples of practicing skills in advance include fire drills, which teach people how to respond to emergencies without a crisis. This allows for learning evacuation routes thoroughly and developing a flexible mindset to adapt to different scenarios. In summary, performing well in crises is a learnable skill that involves preparation, the right mindset, and composure. Practicing a task without pressure, known as shadow boxing, helps to learn the correct techniques and build a flexible mental map. This allows one to perform well under actual pressure. Some key benefits of shadow boxing are, 1. It reduces anxiety and allows clear thinking. Without the pressure to perform, one can focus on learning the proper techniques. 2. It builds muscle memory. Repeated practice of a task without pressure helps the muscles, nerves, and brain to memorize the correct actions. This muscle memory then takes over during the actual performance. 3. It cultivates a calm and confident mental attitude. Shadowboxing helps to build a mental image of oneself performing successfully. This self-image translates to the actual performance and enables one to remain calm. 4. It facilitates improvisation and spontaneity. Because shadowboxing produces a broad and flexible mental map, one can adapt to unforeseen circumstances during the actual performance. 5. It encourages self-expression. Practicing without inhibitions helps to push out one's talents and abilities. This fosters a yes mindset, enabling full self-expression during the performance. Shadowboxing has been used successfully by public speakers, athletes, sharpshooters, and people in all professions to improve their performance under pressure.
Repeated practice in a relaxed setting without negative feedback or anxiety over results is critical. This conditions the mind and body to reproduce the same calm and focused performance in the actual situation. The critical points in the passage are, 1. Practice and preparation can help overcome freezing up in high-pressure situations. The salesman was advised to practice handling objections through imaginary interviews and shadow boxing. This helps build reflexes and the ability to think on your feet. 2. Maintaining an aggressive and positive attitude during a crisis can help tap into hidden powers and strengths. Focusing on the desired outcome rather than the threat helps unlock these powers. Several examples are given of people exhibiting extraordinary strength in crises. 3. The excitement during a crisis should not be mistaken for fear or anxiety. It is a sign of additional strength and energy that can be directed towards your goal. Many successful people, like actors, soldiers, and athletes, experience this excitement and use it to their advantage. 4. Losing the feeling of excitement can be a sign that a task has become too routine. The man who gave frequent speeches noted that he didn't feel the usual excitement and didn't perform as well. The excitement provides an infusion of spirit and energy. 5. The key is maintaining positive goals during a crisis rather than resisting fear or the desire to avoid the situation. The excitement will then reinforce your intention to overcome the problem. The excitement can turn into fear if you lose sight of your goals. The choice is up to you. In summary, the key message is that we have hidden powers and strengths that emerge in times of crisis but we must maintain a positive and committed attitude to access them. With practice and preparation, we can overcome anxiety and freeze-ups by directing the energy of excitement toward our goals. Your unconscious mind works toward goals and results. Once you supply it with a definite purpose, it will determine how to achieve that goal much more effectively than your conscious mind could. To activate your unconscious mind, you must envision the plan as a present possibility, so vividly that it feels natural. We always experience this vivid envisioning of future possibilities when we worry. We picture adverse future outcomes in great detail and experience the emotions accompanying failure. Our mind can't distinguish between vividly imagined and actual events. It will produce feelings and reactions that match what we believe to be true. We will feel like failures if we dwell on failure and imagine it vividly. But if we keep a positive goal in mind, picture it as an accomplished fact, and make it feel real, we will experience the emotions of success, confidence, courage, and faith. We can't directly see whether our unconscious mind is oriented towards success or failure. But we can tell by our feelings. We have the winning feeling when it's oriented towards success. The secret is to evoke the feeling of success. Your unconscious mind will work to achieve success when you consistently picture success and make it feel real. The key points are, 1. Your unconscious mind works toward goals and results. Supply a definite plan to activate it. 2. Picture the goal as a present possibility, so vividly that it feels natural. This activates your unconscious mind. 3. We often make failure feel real through worry. This produces the experience of loss. 4. If you make success feel real through vivid mental images, you will experience confidence and faith in a good outcome. 5. Your feelings tell you if your unconscious mind is oriented toward success or failure. Aim for the winning feeling. 6. The secret is to call up capture, and evoke the feeling of success. Picture success and make it feel real. An example from my life, in graduate school, I frequently worried about failing exams or not understanding complex topics. I pictured these adverse outcomes vividly and felt overwhelmed and incompetent. When I envisioned myself succeeding, showing myself confidently answering questions, getting good grades, and mastering the materials, I felt more self-assured and capable. My worrying decreased, and my actual performance improved. Making success feel real helped reorient my mindset and activate my abilities. Feeling successful and self-confident leads to successful actions and outcomes. When the feeling is strong, you are primed for success. The feeling does not directly cause success but indicates that you are in the right mindset and prepared for success. It is more of a sign that the conditions are right. It is easier to define a clear goal or result and imagine achieving it to capture the feeling of success rather than directly trying to induce the sensation. Using your imagination and memory of past achievements helps generate the feeling. Examples show how a winning feeling led to success in sports, business, and other domains. The feeling overcame obstacles and led to the right actions and results. Science explains the winning feeling through cybernetics and how the brain stores the pattern of successful actions and can replay them. Repeated practice and correcting errors lead to holding successful action patterns that can then be recalled for future use. The brain contains billions of neurons that form connections and circuits. When we experience, think, 
or imagine something, neurons activate in a pattern, learning or having a success store that pattern, which can then be reactivated to produce the winning feeling again. In summary, the winning feeling comes from accessing the stored memory of your past successes. Recalling what you did to succeed in the past, imagining achieving a new sensation, and defining a clear goal are ways to activate that stored pattern and produce the feeling. The feeling then indicates you are primed for success and ready to take action that will lead to a successful outcome. Our brains store memories and knowledge through neural connections and patterns called engrams. These engrams are activated when we remember something. The brain has an almost limitless capacity for learning and forming engrams because neurons can be part of many different engrams. These engrams are like electrical tracks in the brain rather than physical grooves. They are activated or replayed when we remember something. The complexity of neural connections in the brain is beyond imagination. The brain can be considered an incredibly complex machine, far more complex than any human-built computer. We have engrams for all our past successful actions and the feelings associated with them. We can activate these engrams to recreate the winning feelings and actions. We can build success patterns into our brains by starting with achievable successes and gradually progressing to more difficult ones. This helps develop a habit of success and the confidence to take on more significant challenges. Gradual progress and starting with manageable challenges are crucial to building success patterns. Even experts and high achievers sometimes benefit from returning to more manageable tasks. We can activate our built-in success patterns by vividly remembering past successes and their feelings of confidence and achievement. This recreates those winning feelings in the present. We can cultivate faith and courage through positive and constructive worry, mentally picturing the best possible outcome, reminding ourselves it is possible, and imagining the details to activate the feelings associated with success. Don't focus on your fears and anxieties. Focus on the outcomes you desire. In summary, we can leverage the brain's ability to store and activate engrams to build success patterns, recreate winning feelings, and cultivate an optimistic mindset. We can develop confidence and faith in our abilities by gradually progressing from smaller to more significant challenges and focusing on desired outcomes rather than feared ones. General George S. Patton said that while he often felt fear before battle, he never listened to or obeyed his worries. Feeling fear, anxiety, or lack of confidence before an important event is regular and does not necessarily mean you will fail. How you react to these feelings determines your performance. Listening to negative emotions makes you more likely to do poorly but you can choose to ignore them or use them to motivate yourself. Negative feelings originate in your mind, not from some external truth. They reflect your underestimation of your abilities and exaggeration of difficulties. They do not represent the truth about future events, just your attitude. You can accept negative feelings as a challenge and use them to arouse your abilities, as some subjects did in Dr. Ryan's parapsychology experiments. React aggressively to your harmful advice, as Henry Kaiser did to advise that something couldn't be done. You cannot directly control feelings with willpower, but you can replace negative emotions with positive ones. Concentrate on positive imagery, and the negative feelings will fade. This is how to overcome worry, make a habit of substituting pleasant thoughts for worries. The author used this technique as a medical student. Negative feelings of anxiety when answering questions orally became a bell to arouse confidence from his experience answering written questions. He imagined looking through a microscope, felt relaxed, and did well. He became a successful plastic surgeon, helping patients replace negative feelings with hope. In summary, you can choose not to obey negative feelings and instead use positive imagery to cultivate positive, confident feelings. With practice, negative emotions can become a trigger to summon confidence and motivation. Our past experiences and feelings are recorded in our brains as neural engrams. These engrams can be modified and changed, they are not permanent. The present influences the past. Unhappy past experiences and traumas do not doom us or determine our behavior patterns. Our present thinking and attitudes can influence these old engrams. The more an engram is replayed or activated, the more potent it becomes. We should focus on happy and pleasant experiences to strengthen those engrams. We have a choice in what mental recordings we play. We can keep replaying unhappy past experiences or choose to activate success patterns and positive feelings. Willpower and effort aimed directly at our unhappy feelings will not work. We must change the mental imagery, and the feelings will care for themselves. The author believes humans have a life force or vitality that animates our physical bodies. This life force determines our ability to heal, resist disease, and age slowly. A strong constitution that allows some to live long and well seems linked to continually setting meaningful goals to live for. Having a purpose gives us reasons to live. 
An example is given of a professional speaker who avoided burnout and accelerated aging by setting a new goal to play golf on famous courses in every state. This gave him renewed purpose and energy. In summary, we can influence our health, vitality, and aging by managing our mind and mental focus. Choosing to activate positive and life-affirming neural patterns and setting meaningful goals can help slow aging and promote well-being. Focusing on unhappy past events and lacking purpose or meaning has the opposite effect. The author discusses how discovering a new passion for golf while traveling for work reinvigorated an aging speaker's career and outlook on life. He notes that age is somewhat arbitrary and that people can feel older or younger than their chronological age. Maintaining one's life force, or sense of vitality, is critical. The author discusses Dr. Hans Selye's research proving the existence of adaptation energy, or the body's ability to respond to stress and heal itself. When this life force is optimum, people feel and function better recover faster, and stay youthful. The search for ways to maintain this vitality fuels the quest for the elixir of youth. While medical advances have helped extend lifespans, the quality of life depends more on psychological factors. The author searched for why some surgical wounds heal faster than others and found links between healing ability and factors like emotional state. Stress and frustration can inhibit healing, while a positive mindset may aid it. A contemporary anti-aging expert notes that emerging areas like stem cell research and telomere length may lead to life extension in the coming decades. However, lifestyle and behavior also significantly impact how people age. Poverty, lack of education, and chronic stress can accelerate aging, while wealth and success are linked to longevity and longer telomeres. A positive mental attitude alone may not stop aging, but it can help people live long enough to benefit from medical breakthroughs. In summary, The vital life force that allows adaptation and healing depends on physical and psychological factors. Medical technology offers promising options for life extension, but a positive and empowered mindset can help maintain the quality of life and allow people to thrive for longer. Reducing stress and frustration while cultivating a success mentality and new passions can rejuvenate one's outlook and career. Ultimately, youthfulness is a state of mind. Emotional stress can worsen the effects of physical injury or aging by using up our body's adaptation energy. Indulging in negative emotions can make us age faster. Some people heal rapidly from surgery or illness. These rapid healers tend to be optimistic, expecting to recover quickly because they have a purpose or goals. Their positive mindset activates their body's healing mechanisms. Placebos and suggestions show that mental attitudes and expectations can influence the body's healing abilities. Expecting to improve or get well can help activate the body's healing mechanisms. We may unconsciously think ourselves into old age by expecting to grow old and useless at a certain age, setting up an opposing goal for our body to achieve. Fear of aging and cutting out activity can accelerate aging. Lack of exercise reduces blood flow, slowing waste removal and drying up capillaries. Staying active and exercising is vital to staying young. We have basic needs for love, security, creative expression, recognition, new experiences, self-esteem, and more life. Looking forward to the future with anticipation creates a demand for more energy, which the body will adapt to by providing more vigor and vitality. Creativity and having goals or purpose create a need for more life. Creative, productive people tend to live longer, staying active and vital. We should develop an enthusiasm for a life and look forward to the future to establish a need for more energy. Actors and actresses often look young because they need to maintain a youthful appearance for their careers. Our emotional reactions to life events, not just age, cause aging. Peasant women who resigned to hard labor age prematurely, showing that mindset and expectation affect aging. Widowhood and loss of purpose or will to live can cause premature aging and health decline. In summary, our mindset, attitudes, expectations, and cultivation of purpose or goals in life significantly impact our health, longevity, and aging. Positive, optimistic, and forward looking mindsets slow aging, while negative, pessimistic, and aimless mindsets accelerate aging. Establishing a need for more life through creativity, goals, and anticipation helps slow aging and maintain vitality. Resigning oneself to hardship, loss of purpose, or expectation of decline and uselessness speeds up aging and health deterioration. A widow's attitude and outlook on life after loss often determines how she will age physically and mentally. An optimistic attitude can lead to continued growth, while a pessimistic attitude can accelerate aging and decline. Many men go downhill rapidly after retirement because they feel useless and lack purpose. It is not the act of retiring that causes decline, but rather the attitudes and self-image that come with it. One can continue to live a mentally and physically vigorous life well into old age.
outdated medical beliefs wrongly taught that physical activity harms older adults. Recent research shows that exercise and activity are essential for health and well-being at any age. While intense activity should be built up gradually, one is always young enough to start exercising. The author believes in miracles because the body's healing processes are not fully understood. Although science can describe the biological mechanisms of healing, the underlying forces behind why and how it works remain a mystery. The author sees healing as evidence of intelligence beyond our understanding. The author sees no conflict between medical science and religious faith. They are both means to access the life force and should be used together for the best results. Refusing one or the other makes no sense. To get the most out of life, we should not limit the channels through which life and help come to us. We must be open to receiving from whatever sources, whether science, religion, psychology, or other means. We must also be willing to both accept and offer help to others. We should not limit life by feeling unworthy or not good enough. We are made in God's image, when we accept our worthiness, we access a source of strength and power. The exercises and techniques in this book have proven to help many experiences more life. The author believes they can do the same for readers. The summary touches on the major themes around attitude and self-image determining the quality of life, the need to remain active and purposeful as one ages, openness to various forms of knowledge and help, self-acceptance, and the promise of the book's approach. The relaxed state you achieve through mental imagery grows stronger and carries into your daily life. Missing a day of practice causes noticeable effects. Regular exercise improves your ability to visualize positive outcomes, creating a sense of flow. However, this flow requires a consistent approach to the principles in psychocybernetics, not just occasional reading or practice. Psychocybernetics does not require setting deadlines for goals. While deadlines can help some plans, they can hinder others by causing tension and limiting creativity. The purpose of mental imagery is to provide a relaxed plan for your creative mind without deadlines or limits. If a deadline causes anxiety about achieving the goal, it can inhibit progress. It is often better to visualize the plan, take action as it feels right, and let progress unfold. It is best to start by visualizing short-term or emotionally significant goals before tackling long-term ones. This builds confidence in the process. With consistent mental imagery practice, intuitive abilities like ESP may develop spontaneously. Dr. Maltz hinted at this possibility in his mentions of parapsychology research. The author found his intuitive skills improved dramatically with mental imagery practice. The author shares a traumatic experience where he was assaulted and suffered severe facial injuries from a glass pitcher. In the aftermath, his coach Dan Gable visited him in the hospital. Gable had overcome his tragedy, the murder of his sister, through strength and perseverance. His presence gave the author comfort during a difficult time. The author's recovery from this drama took six months but helped build character through adversity. In summary, the relaxed, flexible, and consistent practice of mental imagery techniques from psychocybernetics can develop intuitive abilities, a sense of flow, and the perseverance to overcome adversity. While deadlines and long-term goals have their place, starting small and avoiding rigid constraints allows for the most creativity and progress. With time and practice, the benefits from these techniques become an integrated part of your daily life. The author got into a bar fight at age 19 and suffered injuries, including a glass pitcher smashing into his face. He received medical attention and a settlement of $16,000, which he used to start his personal training business after college. Though 25 years had passed, he realized he still carried pain and trauma from the incident. He decided to revisit the memory in his mind, reliving all the details. At first, he felt amazed at re-experiencing it in different ways. But then he felt deep sadness and grief at being unable to fight back during the event. He realized this feeling of humiliation and helplessness had created an internal scar more significant than the physical one. A voice of compassion told him to forgive himself and the other man. He pictured the man, smiled, and blessed him. He turned the shattered pitcher into a feather, writing his ticket through life. The voice said many people feel unable to fight back in life and he could show them how to forgive and find new mental freedom. The spokesperson said everything starts with mental pictures, and anything undesirable can be changed by changing them. Forgiveness, do, is a mental picture. Through this process, the author could finally release the trauma and find inner peace. The mental pictures that had long haunted him lost their power. He realized that while the past cannot be changed, the meaning we attach to it and its effect on us is within our control. Here is a summary of the entries, Elixir of Youth, P. 273 to 75 the secret of staying young is maintaining a youthfulness attitude by having a zest for life and new interests new challenges and goals promote the production of hormones like hgh that slow aging 
Emerson, Ralph Waldo, p. 27, 30, 32, 115, Quotes on Self-Reliance, Healthy-Mindedness, Imagination, and Attitude. Emotions, Aging from Emotional Stress, p. 275, Chronic Negative Emotions Can Accelerate Aging Through Hormone Changes and Other Mechanisms. Easing Pressure from Emotions, p. 215, Using Relaxation Techniques Like Metal Pictures to Blow Off Emotional Steam. Emotional Carryovers, p. 216-18, Our Emotional State Often Carries Over From One Situation to the Next. We Can Condition Ourselves to Respond More Calmly by Practicing Equanimity. Purpose of Emotions, p. 238, Excitement Motivates Us to Work Towards Our Goals. We Should Channel Emotions Productively Rather Than Bottling Them Up. Emotional Scars, p. 166-83, Negative Emotional Experiences from the Past That Continue to Haunt Us. We Can Heal Emotional Scars Through Forgiveness, Thought Control, Spiritual Transformation, and Understanding That We Are No Longer The Person We Were Then. Resentment and Guilt Are Major Contributors to Emotional Scars. Failure Mechanism, p. 145-63, A Self-Perpetuating Cycle of Negative Thoughts, Emotions, and Behaviors Resulting from Deep Insecurity and Inadequacy. It manifests through frustration, aggression, emptiness, uncertainty, resentment, and loneliness. We can overcome it by recognizing and avoiding these unhealthy patterns of thinking. Goals, having concrete plans and working steadily towards them is crucial to happiness, motivation, success, and youthfulness. We should set short-term and long-term goals and refocus on them when frustrated or unmotivated. Imagination, p. 36-52, the invention drives our self-image, creativity, motivation, and success. We can achieve remarkable transformations in our self-image, skills, and accomplishments using visualization and mental rehearsal. Success is first created in the imagination. Inhibition, p.187-204, excessive restraints on behavior and lack of spontaneity. Inhibition is caused by too much negative feedback, self-criticism, and concern over what others think. It can be overcome by practicing disinhibition and self-acceptance. Optimal inhibition allows us to act with free creativity, vigor, and appropriate restraint. Here is a summary of the key points from the passage. Personality is defined in various ways but essentially refers to the unique traits and characteristics that shape a person's thinking, feeling, and behavior. According to Maltz, there are two main types of personalities, success-type characters and failure-type personalities. Success-type personalities possess qualities like courage, compassion, self-confidence, and self-acceptance. A sense of inferiority, uncertainty, and the expectation of failure dominates failure-type characters. A person's self-image, their mental picture, shapes their personality and behavior. Improving your self-image can help you unlock your true potential and develop a success-type character. The success instinct and failure instinct refer to automatic response patterns that lead to successful or unsuccessful outcomes. Reprogramming your failure instinct into a success instinct is vital to psychocybernetics. Relaxation, visualization, and rational thinking are three main techniques used in psychocybernetics to reprogram self-image and instincts. Relaxation helps overcome inhibitions, visualization uses mental imagery to modify self-image, and logical thinking challenges negative and irrational beliefs. Other key concepts include the creative mechanism, your built-in motivation for self-fulfillment, the success mechanism, your ability to solve problems and achieve goals, and the servo mechanism, the automatic mechanism responsible for keeping your self-image and behavior consistent. Emotional scars, social slights, shame, and resentment can damage self-image and must be overcome through techniques like forgiveness, group psychotherapy, and spiritual facelifts. Daily practice and repetition of psychocybernetics techniques are required to reap the benefits. Reprogramming your self-image and instincts is a gradual process that takes continuous effort and time. That covers the essence of the passage's summary points on pages 147 to 148. Please let me know if you would like me to explain anything in the summary in more detail. Dr. Maxwell Maltz was a plastic surgeon who noticed some of his patients still felt unhappy even after he performed cosmetic surgeries to give them the perfect faces they wanted. He realized false beliefs in their subconscious mind often distort people's perceptions of themselves. He wrote about this discovery in his book New Faces, New Futures. He suggested people often see themselves inaccurately. After years of research and counseling patients, he published his findings in Psychocybernetics in 1960. The book became an instant bestseller. Dr. Maltz went on to write many more books applying his Psychocybernetics principles to different areas of life.
Matt Fury is a self-help author and trainer who has built on Dr. Maltz's work. He teaches psycho-cybernetics and mind-body fitness techniques. Fury coaches athletes, business people, and entrepreneurs. He is president of the Psycho-Cybernetics Foundation, which offers seminars and coaching on psycho-cybernetics. The summary outlines how Dr. Maltz discovered people's self-perceptions are often inaccurate and the profound impact of his work on many people's lives through psycho-cybernetics. Matt Fury has continued to spread and build on Maltz's teachings. Book link click here.